Pastor Tola Odutola, FCA, is the senior pastor of Jesus House Baltimore. He was a chartered accountant at Pete Marwick, KPMG, and at DHL as Treasury Controller and Business Development Manager before being called into full-time ministry. In addition to being the senior pastor at Jesus House Baltimore, Pastor Tola is the chairman of Alpha Leadership Conference, an organization charged with promoting and teaching leadership skills to all people of all nations. He consults, mentors, and coaches pastors, speaks regularly at leadership conferences, churches, corporations, ministers conferences, seminars, and other leadership development opportunities. He is the author of I Am Better Than This and The Line Crossers. He has a passion to challenge people to pursue and maximize their God-given potential. Pastor Tola is happily married to Pastor Kofo Odutola and they're blessed with three lovely children. Ladies and gentlemen, make welcome Pastor Tola Odutola. Good evening everyone. Um, once again, it's my pleasure to, to be here. Uh, we thank God for the morning sessions. Um, both um, Dr. Sam Chand and uh, Banky Wellington, they were such great blessings to us. And um, if you were not around when we did that or you didn't you know, log on, you can get uh, copies of this and uh, you can go to our website, alphaleadership.net, alphaleadership.net, and you can do a demand run and uh, get copies of the messages. Tonight, I'm talking about structure and restructuring life and, and in ministry. Um, I want to put out a caveat before I go on, uh, start, uh, that when we hear about restructuring, uh, especially for those who, who are based in Nigeria, who are watching right now, I know it's quite late for you. I wanted to know that this has nothing to do with politics you know, of Nigeria, of people clamoring for one restructuring or the other. This is purely leadership uh, you know, that we can use for our daily um, you know, ongoings and outgoings. Um, the first thing is that it's impossible for many things to be done today without adequate structures in place. Uh, whether you are a church, whether you are an organization, even in life in general, it's almost impossible for you to achieve anything that is worthwhile without adequate you know, structures in place. Every organization, Every organization needs structures to operate at their best. Every organization needs structure to operate at their best. When you look at the body or the composition of man or woman, you see that God created everything intentionally. You know, <clears throat> without our bones being strong enough, there is no way it can carry our flesh and our body. So there are structures that are very important in day-to-day -day life. When we the difference between the developed world and the underdeveloped, you know, nations is basically because of stru structures, you know, they call it infrastructure, you know, but the structure is important. The infra there is something that is underneath. So, so infrastructure means a structure that is under the real structure itself. And without this structure, everything becomes almost impossible. And I'm sure many of us can relate to many countries like that, you know, that are having challenges, even though they have wealth of people, of, of you know, knowledge of people and, uh, you know, assets, but they can't perform at their best because of lack of structure. So what is structure? What is structure? You know, structure is organization of parts, of parts as dominated by the character of the whole. Uh, what does that mean? It's how different parts of the body or different parts of an organizational system is composed of in order to make the whole organization to be one you know in an organization there are many structures and even in like needed for you and i to succeed there is the visionary structure without a vision the bible says that the people perish so you need a vision where are you going how do i get to where i'm going you understand and and we need financial structure 
We need financial structure. We need technical and IT structure. We need administrative structure. So there are many types of structures that we need for all things to work together. But all these structures, they are needed for the organization, the church in particular, or ministry, to come together to be able to achieve their corporate objective. Now, the challenge is this. Because of the nature, of the spiritual nature of the church, many churches and pastors have neglected this aspect of administration or structure. And because of that, they are paying the price you know, for you today. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, at times, I talk to a lot of pastors and I realize that many pastors are busy. I mean so busy that they don't even have time to visualize where they are going, to even think about where the church or the ministry is going next. Why? Because there is no structure in place. They are the ones that do everything. They do everything from banking to this one, to choir, to ushering. They are the ones doing everything. Why? Because there is no structure in place. Many years ago, we had a naming ceremony, you know, where it's, a, you know, uh, where you, you gather together as a church and a people to name a child on the eighth day. And um, we were going to name this baby from our church, but I just had some medical procedure done. So I knew I could not do the naming ceremony, but I was there because the person who had the baby is very cl close to me and important in the church. But I said to someone who was deputizing for me, this is how we're gonna go about it. You start the praise and the worship, you do this, you do that. And then everything was okay. I said, when it's time for prayer, I will come. I was trying to put structure in place for this naming ceremony. All of a sudden, as we started the praise and worship, someone just raised another song. <laughs> and the person that was supposed to be leading looked at me. And, and I said, you are the one in charge. You do what we have to do. So when the other party raised the, the song, the whole congregation that were there, the people, they followed her. So this person that was leading earlier on now said, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, stopped the whole meeting and said, please let all things be done in decency and in order. We're going to start again. That was the last we had of the lady that apparently where she was coming from, this is my assumption. You know, maybe that's how they do it in their church. Anybody as the spirit leads, you know, when you deal with issues like that as the spirit leads, you find out that the whole thing becomes chaotic. You know, so you need structure in order not to have a chaotic moment because every vision or calling or anointing without adequate structures in place might not show significant results. Every vision or calling or anointing without adequate structures, adequate structures in place might not show significant results. In, in the scriptures, in Exodus 18, um, Moses was called by God. We all know that. And uh, the father-in-law of Moses looked at Moses and saw the way Moses was handling the day-to-day -day running of the church and how he was talking to everybody, how he was you know, ministering to them. How he was... All of a sudden, the father-in-law said to him, look, young man, I know you are called by God, but you need to put structure in place. The way you are going, if you are not careful, you will wear out. There are a lot of people today, either individually or in ministry or even corporately, you are wearing out. Why? Because there is no adequate structure in place. Even if you don't know how to set up the structures, I've always said this, you can look for people with experience within the church or the ministry to help you to set up this structure. I want you to know today, what we are doing today by you know, coming to you virtually and all that, I wasn't the one that set it up. Even though I had a vision of GLC, I had a vision of who we're going to invite, or the vision of what we're going to talk about, but I had to look for people who are well versed in IT matters, in computer matters, who can connect things, who can make things happen. And that's how you have to put structure in place. You know, you don't have to be the one that does everything. You can look for people around you to do this 
work. Now, I'm going to share with us tonight about five points of things to consider when we talk about structure and restructuring. Number one, structure is the backbone of any organization. Structure is the backbone of any organization. You know, in Mark chapter three, Jesus called disciples, you know, to himself. And the Bible said that he called those that he wanted to himself and they came to him that he might also send them out to preach, you know, and all that. Now, this call is a classic example of people as structures. No organization, whether you're a church or otherwise, can thrive without people. You can't. Even if you are buying and selling, you need people to buy from and you need people to sell to. People are our greatest assets and structure. Without people, vision becomes frustration. Even though the Bible says that without a vision, the people perish. But then you twist it the other way. Without people, the vision also perishes. So it's important that we understand the place of people in every structure. They are our greatest assets. They should be treated right, including those who are in ministry, pastors. I've said this many times in our church when I'm preaching, and I said, and I'm talking about appreciation, that if you walk in a place or you are in a relationship and you feel unappreciated, it is like a slave yard. Nobody wants to do slavery these days. Slavery ended a long time ago. So when people do things and they feel unappreciated, either by the organization or by the church or by the ministry, and there are many ways that we can appreciate people. I'm telling you, you know, it's not just about money. So I'm not talking money, but I'm talking about feeling appreciated for what you are doing. You know, uh, I, I say this when, when I talk to my wife and I say, you know one thing, you know, it's good for husbands and their wives to appreciate each other. Every time I eat in my house, I say to my wife, thank you. Thank you for the meal. Because the bottom line is this, you might have a wife and she refuses to cook for you. Even if she doesn't refuse, she might not even know how to cook. Even if she knows how to cook, she might have even the best cook or whatever. But when someone is appreciated for the work that they are doing, you realize that they are excited and they are ready to do more. So it's important for us to understand the appreciation of people. Laban spoke to the, uh, Jacob. Laban said to Jacob, I have realized that by your sake, since you came into my organization, that my organization has grown very big. Now, if he knew that, how come he changed his wages 10 times? Downwards, not upwards. Because he lacked appreciation for people. You know, people are our greatest assets. So when we have a structure that helps to track performances, this helps in rewarding people. We must have a structure that helps to track performances. How are we doing? How are we doing? Uh, what is there to do? so that we can go on. There must be a feedback. There must be talking amongst ourselves to know how we are doing. Do you understand? When we do this, when we have a system like that, we are able to attract as a church or a ministry or even a business, quality individuals with skills and abilities. When people come to your church or your ministry and they see things going the way it's supposed to go, I'm telling you, people are attracted. I net worth people are attracted to the ministry. Why? Because they, they have been out there in the world. They know how things work in the world. So they are asking themselves, why is it that we come to the church that there is no structure? How come the sound system is not sounding right? How come the people are not singing right? How come they say they will start at nine and now there is 10.30 and they are saying as the spirit leads? How come somebody is handling the mic and is preaching and is preaching for almost two hours? Now, I know I'm talking to one or two people right now, you know, but honestly, this conference is to help you. So don't take offense. Just humble yourself and say, you know what? Maybe there are things I need to change. And as we change those things, your things become better and better. Jesus started his ministry with people and he put structure in place. There was someone who was in charge of money. Never mind the fact that he was stealing, but he was in charge of money, put him there. 
There was someone who was so close to him that anything that he wants to do, he tells him, I'm talking about structure. When he was going to go to the cross, he put that one in charge of his mom. There was someone who was there, and his name is Peter. When he was going to leave here, he put the church, Peter in charge of the church. I'm talking about structure. So don't spiritualize or over-spiritualize structure. It's important. God could not do anything on the earth until he put structure in place. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and God's darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Holy Spirit moved upon the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light, and was light. And in that same day, he created the day and the night, and the day was with light, and the night was in the evening. Now, look at how God separated all this. Until there was structure in place, he could not call out the animals. He could not call out the fishes. He could not call out the sea. He could not call out the plants. How much more he did not even create man until he had put all the structures in place, such that the Garden of Eden was already there before man was created. It's time for us to put people's structure in place. Number two, number two, I want you to know that structure determines the pathway to our visions. Structure determines the pathway to our visions. It's important that we know where we are going or else when you get there, you will not recognize it or you might not even have an idea if you get there. So in visualizing our destination or our vision or where we are going, you must come up with how to get there. I live in Maryland. I'm in Baltimore right now on Wisdom Road. That's the church. The bottom line is that if I want to go to a place called Ellicott City, even if you don't know Maryland, Ellicott City is about 25 minutes drive. And there are many other, there are many ways that can get to Ellicott City. I must have an idea where I'm going first. If I get lost on the way, and I park at a gas station, and I'm saying, I'm going to Ellicott City. Can you please direct me to Ellicott City? The first question every reasonable person will ask you, where exactly are you going in Ellicott City? It's not likely I might be two minutes away from the place, but because I don't know where I'm going, because the, I don't have that structure in, okay, where am I going? How am I gonna get there? then I might not even know. And we see this every day. So it's important that we put structure in place. It gives us an idea. It helps us to determine the pathway to our vision. There was a story in Mark chapter 6. It's about Jesus uh, preaching to many people. And at nighttime, he knew the people were hungry. So he asked the disciples, what shall we give these people that they may eat? And the disciples said so many things, you know, were able to see their mindset. They said, even if, if we buy the whole of this place and close up a whole store, that the food will not be enough. You know, even if we get this and we divide it into little, little pieces, how much is it? And now Jesus, you know, but suddenly they said, oh, there's a guy here who has five loaves and two fishes. And Jesus said to them, make the people to sit. Make the people to sit. What was he putting in place? He was putting structure. He knew what he was going to do, but he was defining a pathway to get to where he was going. Why? These are people who have followed him all day long. They are hungry. There are many of them because they said he fed 5,000 men. So we don't know how many women were there or the children. But the bottom line is that they were hungry. Can you imagine hungry 10,000 people following Jesus, all of a sudden food is provided. What's going to happen is that suddenly there will be chaos. There can be, there can be a stampede. There will be running. There will be shouting. But Jesus wanted to calm everybody down. He said, I ring them in fifties and in hundreds. I'm talking about structure in place. Many people today will have looked at the spiritual aspect alone. He blessed the bread and the fish and he multiplied. Yes, thank God for the miracle of multiplication. But then, 
thank God that no lives were lost because lives could have been lost in that. What Jesus did was that he taught of the spiritual and he also taught of the administrative and he merged both together. I always say this, you can chew gum and walk at the same time. You can chew gum and walk at the same time. The experience of structure as used by the early church in starting fellowship comes to mind. Can you imagine preaching and 3,000 people show up at your church? 5,000 people show up at your church. What do you do with them? There must be a structure in place. Many times as pastors and ministers, we'll pray for growth. And I ask myself, if the prayer of growth is answered today, what will you do with the growth? Because we're not ready. We pray for growth, but then we don't put things in place when the growth starts to show up so that we are able to accommodate the people. But what did the early church do? They set up fellowships in homes, in homes, because they knew that it was almost going to be impossible to, to, to get three, 5,000 people in one place again. And they said, why don't we put them in homes? Let people be in charge of 12, 12 people, and then we can be able to minister to them in that way. It is important. What it does is that it helps the church or the ministry to see beyond the founder. To see beyond the founder. Because if there is a pathway to the destination of an organization or ministry or church, what it does is that no matter who the founder is, whether you are on seat or you are not around, or you are no more in the organization, people are able to see where we are going. They are able to follow a pathway because it has been laid down. One of the challenges of many churches, especially African churches, is that there is just no pathway to when the founder takes an exit. There's just none. And that's why many of those churches crumble immediately the founder leaves or a strong leader leaves. It crumbles. And there are many churches, and I'm not going to mention the, the names of these churches, but start thinking, start thinking back. Start thinking back to those churches. You know, because we're all alive to see it. Start thinking back to those churches. You know, because, because there was nothing in place as structures that this is who takes over. This is what happens. Everything is left for the spirit. And people have manipulated the spirit as it were to feel or to achieve their own objective. Praise God. You know, are there structures on ground for us as we are planning to expand our ministries? Number three, number three, I'm talking about things to know about structures. Can the structure that brought you here take you further? The structure, whatever structure you have right now, can it take you further from where you are? There's a scripture I love a lot, Ecclesiastes 10.10. 10. Ecclesiastes 10.10, 10. the NIV translation says, if the ax is dull and its edge is unsharpened, more strength is needed. But skill will bring success. Because of constant changes in the landscape and stru structure should be reviewed periodically. Structure should not be cut in stone in such that it cannot be reviewed. There are things that brought you and I to where we are. If we are going to go beyond where you are, you need something else in place or more in place to be able to go to where you're going. There is no way you can have a foundation for a house, for instance, that wants to take one floor. And that same house or that same foundation is used to take 10 floors. That's why buildings crumble. Because the structure that was in place is not strong enough to take that same building to several floors and layers above. The COVID pandemic has taught us many lessons. And one of the lessons is what we are doing right now. You know, I've had some churches have 
insisted that everything must be life. I understand and, and I appreciate their frustration. But honestly, truth be told, churches will never get back to what it used to be again. That everything is life, I'm telling you right now. It will never. Before COVID, we used to do this conference live. We took it all over the world. We took it to Europe. We took, we took it to Africa. We were in Kenya. We were in Ghana. We were in Nigeria several times, you know, and so many other places. We were about taking it to Rwanda when COVID started. And now here we are. Now we are doing virtual. Now there are many people who are joining us from places that we didn't even think anybody could join us or we didn't even think we could take this conference to. People joining from Sweden and so many other places like that. And, and you're saying to yourself, my goodness, who do I know in Sweden that I would take the conference to Sweden? But now we're online. I'm talking about the structure. So if we develop, if we depended rather only on the structure that we had when we were on ground, even that going on ground, you need a structure to be able to succeed. If not, you are going to be frustrated because there's no way I could take you from Baltimore and take all the maintainers, all the IT people, all the uh, multimedia, all the technical people and, and, and take everybody to Nigeria. It's massive. So you, we need a structure in place, even when we are doing you know, real on, uh, um, on site. How much more now that we are doing something else? So can the people around you or the system you are running, can they take you to your next level? Can the people around you or the system that you are running, can they take you to your next level? If not, then it's time for you to start thinking of restructuring. I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. David used the stone to kill Goliath. But guess what? The stone could not cut off the head of Goliath. So he needed a sword and he did not have the sword. And he took the sword from Goliath. That is scripture. If scripture cannot be broken, why are we breaking it in terms of organization in the church? It's important. We have to understand how this thing. There will always be need for restructuring and the sharpening goes on. It goes on, it goes on. The day we stop restructuring, that's the day the organization, the ministry of the church starts to come down, start to come down. So it's important that we know that if you wait too long before you begin to restructure, it creates frictions in the organization, in the organization. You know, in the Acts of the Apostles in the early church, you know, um, they started giving food out to the widows and the food was not okay. It didn't go out, you know, to everybody. It didn't go around to everybody. And then they started, the, the widows started complaining. So what did the disciples do? They said, we need to do something. They, down, they now said, let's create some group of people called Dickens. Let them be in charge of the food. Who will be in charge of the word and other pr and prayer? What, what did they create? They created structure. They created structure immediately because if they didn't do that, they were going to have a problem on their hands. Without good structure, nothing built will endure generationally. I repeat, without a good structure, nothing built will endure generationally. I also say this, without good structure, many act busy and then they become exhausted. I know many pastors, many leaders who are, who are exhausted right now. Yeah, and then part of it is because there's no good structure in place. There's no good structure in place. So they are the one doing everything. As a matter of fact, if they are not around, nothing moves. It's time to set up structure. If there's anybody in your church or in your department or your ministry that if they don't come to church on a Sunday, that department you know, is demobilized, it's time for you either to remove them or to make sure you set up new structures. Because one person should not hold an entire assembly to ransom because of lack of structure. Is the one that holds the key, is the one that knows how to put on the, the sound, is the one that knows how to put it off, is the one that knows how to do this. No, 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 no. 
it's time for us to put structure in place because when we become too busy, what happens is that there is no time for thinking about the future or doing new things. Number four, I hope you are getting something tonight. Number four, structure is about ability first and loyalty becomes a plus. Hmm. This is very important. Structure is about ability first and loyalty becomes a plus. Someone said to me <laughs> a few years ago, he said, I cannot hire who I cannot fire. <laughs> I said, my goodness. It wasn't as if what he said was rocket science. But all of a sudden, I took it as a rema. Because the question we asked him was, is your wife working with you? This is not a ministry. It's just a business. He said, no. He said, I can't hire who can, I cannot fire. He said, if I fire my wife, will I not sleep in the same house? Or am I not going to go home? And it's the same thing with a lot of us. We confuse loyalty with ability. The fact that you are my cousin does not mean that you have the ability to do the work. We confuse it. The fact that you are loyal in ministry, you really revere me, you really honor me as your pastor, does not mean you can do the work. So when I put someone in charge who has a lot of loyalty, but this person is unable to perform, I am creating mediocrity. And this is what we have in a lot of ministries and churches today. Jesus appointed 12, Mark 3, 14, that they might be with him. Note that number one point, that they might be with him. And then that he might send them out to preach was the second one. And that he might send them out. So the main reason is that you must be with me, learn of me, understand me, know what I'm, I'm for. And then I might send you out to preach. There is always room for somebody that is loyal, but there are some positions that they cannot occupy because they don't have the ability to do it. I always ask people this, when we talk about Christian and this and that, and that I say, who would you rather fly your plane? A pilot or a Christian, a believer? And everybody looks at me like some of you are wondering right now. Honestly, I want a pilot to fly me. The pilot doesn't have to be a Christian as long as he can take the plane off, fly the plane and land the plane and I get home safe. What is the use of somebody speaking in tongues who cannot, <laughs> who cannot fly, fly a plane and then you put him there and then he crashes everybody and you're wondering what happened? No, 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 nothing happened. You made it happen. This is not the devil. And you know some churches, they will not start be praying. They say, this is a devil attack. Devil attack, really? Really? It's either you are an accountant or you are not. Accounting is not based on speaking in tongues. It's based on you knowing where do I charge this expense? Where do I take this money to? How do I treat this? It's important that we... Let us stop putting people in positions that they cannot function in. Loyalty does not equate ability. You know, Paul says something to, to Timothy. He said, be diligent to come to me quickly. That's in 2 Timothy 4, 9. He said, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and departed for Thessalonica. Christians has departed for Galatia. Titus has gone to Ladamatia. He said, only Luke is with me. He said, but get Mark and bring him with you. For this Mark is useful for me for ministry. Is useful for me for ministry. Is useful for me for ministry. Honestly, if you are going to hang around me, you must be useful for me for ministry. It's important. It's important. If I'm looking for people that will be cracking jokes with me, that's another ball game entirely. But if we are talking about ministry and pushing this ministry forward, it is important. It's the same thing with our individual lives. 
you must be able to know who you talk to when you are talking about your finances. Who do I talk to when I want to improve on my career? Who do I talk to when it comes to my marriage? It's important. I can't be talking to a single lady about a man or lady about my marriage when you are not even married. It doesn't matter how close we can be. I can't talk to you about that because you, you have no clue. Everything you are talking to talk about is not going to be experiential. It's just going to be maybe you read it or you studied some people. Or, no, it's when you are inside the matter. That's when we know how it is. It's important that we understand this, you know, because the structure, whether human or otherwise, must be able to solve the problem that it was intended for. The structure in place must be able to solve the problem that it was intended for, you know. Um, the question I ask, especially electronic giving, an example in the church, is this solving the giving challenges or is creating other problems itself? Are the deacons in church, are they solving the problems in the church or they are politicizing their positions? It's important. Paul says something to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He said, the things you have heard from me amongst many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. What ensures continuity in our organizations is based on the structures we set up and the people we commit it into. What ensures, I say it again, continuity in our ministry, life, or businesses, or wealth, is the people will commit this thing into their hands and whether they are able to manage it or not. And finally tonight, I'm going to go on the fifth one, on structure. But this has to do with restructuring. No structure should be permanent that it cannot be tweaked or adjusted. No structure should be permanent that it cannot be tweaked, excuse me. Or adjusted. Every structure should be subjected to constant reviews. Every structure should be subjected to constant reviews. <laughs> ah. It's the same thing at times with some doctrines of some churches. There's a church that many years ago, they never believed in watching TV. Not to talk of being virtual online. Because they saw it as instruments of the devil. Today, is different. The general overseer is on TV, is on radio. So what happened to the doctrine of the devil was behind the TV. Revelation is progressive. Today, the same church, not too long ago, I read their leader saying, Churches should stop forcing people to put on scarf when they come to church. <laughs> uh, these are things that some of us have had to fight, especially when we're in a denomination. That scarf or you wear pants honestly does not determine whether you're acceptable before God or not. Because I realized. That's, you know, tying wrapper is not a lady's uh, uh, way of dressing alone. It might be in my country, in some, you know, my country, but in some other Asian countries, it is the men that tie the wrapper. So which one? Are we going to say that we're not going to preach the gospel to them? Because they are dressed like women. Just give me a break. Part of this revelation that is progressive is lack of 
exposure. It's lack of exposure. You know, people embrace what they are only exposed to. And like they say in Africa, that if you have not been into another man's farm, you say your father's farm is the biggest. Times and seasons will test structures. Times and seasons will test structures. What do I mean by that? Let's look at structures that our parents put in place in discipline us, in bringing us up. For those of my friends who are living in developed worlds today, either you're in America or you're in the UK, you're in Canada or any of these countries or in Sweden, I double dare you, bring up your children the way your parents brought you up, whether you will not end up in jail. These were structures. They believed so much in it and they believed up to today that it was these structures that helped us. Yes, I know. Maybe some people didn't need to be beaten that much and they will still have achieved what God has in store for them. So I'm not beating down our parents, but what I'm saying is that no structure should be carved out in stone that it cannot be tweaked or you get it better. And I'm talking about structure. All I knew in structure about cleaning dishes is I am the dishwasher as an individual until a few years ago that I realized that we've had this dishwasher in our house and we've not used it. And our children kept on saying, there's a reason why the dishwasher is there. It doesn't have to be human beings. And we started now, even I, I load the dishwasher. Every, we load the dishwasher, you put it there, it washes the thing. I'm talking about structures that were put in, these were things that were put in place, embedded in us, thinking that that is the only way. You know why? I never saw a dishwasher in my life. I never. Until I came to America, even when I had it in my house, I did not make use of it because to me, it was totally irrelevant. I know I'm, I'm breaking some structures right now. And I'm talking about structures in our mind now. You know, I, you know, as time goes on, this is what happened. As time changes, structures become either obsolete or irrelevant. Let us look at the banking structure. There was a time that banks had brick and mortar that you have to go into the banking hall and then you talk to the teller and then you say you want to have an appointment with the manager, even though some banks still do it, but there are some banks right now, you don't see Jack, you don't see anybody. They take your money, they withdraw it, you withdraw it. There was a time when checks was part of structure of banking. You write a check and then you get money out. The only person writing checks now are people in my age. Nobody, no, if you are using a check right now, know that you are in my generation. Why? There was a time people carry money around because we have this, especially people from Africa, that, oh, if you go out there and you have an accident with somebody selling eggs, will they, you know, literally, those are the kind of things that we say. They say, oh, you need money. I realize that my children don't carry any cash. And I say, you don't have a wallet, you don't have a pocket. say, I don't need it. I have my phone. Really? Why? Because people pay me a phone now. Boom. Boom. I'm talking about no structure should be so rigid. My dad had a rotary phone in our house. For those of us who, who, who don't know rotary phones, it, you, 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 it's circular in nature, and then they are black, and then you begin to, 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 to dial. 037-432-635. That's the number of my father's phone in our house. That's the number. Do you understand? And if you die, if he wants to punish you, he will give you 10 names and say, sit down there, call all my friends. These are the 10 friends, call them. So by the time you die at 03 something, the thing cuts up, then you start again. The thing cuts up before you get one. But today, there's something called speed dial. You speak into your phone and it dials for you. I'm talking about structures. I'm talking about structures. It's time for us to look at the structure we have. If this structure cannot take you to where you want to go to, 
it's time to begin to tweak it, to begin to adjust it. The way we used to do church, it has changed. It has changed. We used to go to church with Dick's Bible. Very big. The bigger your Bible, the more anointed and spiritual we believe you are. Today, I, 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 I don't see anybody carrying Bible again. No. It's either on your iPad or on your telephone. Why? Because things have changed. Even to write notes now. People don't write notes physically again. The people that write notes, I'm telling you today, they are my generation. I'm still the only one in my generation and some of my friends that write notes. I have a notepad right on my table. People don't write notes. Especially if they use all these uh, uh, very intelligent notes. They just go to the notes section of the thing and just type whatever it is. People don't write notes again. People know your age <laughs> by the things that you still do. Even though you might not be that old, but if you are still doing old stuff, they know that you belong to the old generation. We are not many, so you are welcome. But the bottom line is that it's time for us to start changing. My advice to every pastor today, don't be the last to get the memo. Church has changed. It's time for you to change as well. You've prayed enough, and God has answered your prayer by bringing you across this conference. It's time to take all the things that we have learned, go back home, and start making changes. And before I finish this and round this up, we have a group that is called GLPA, Great Leaders Pastors Alliance. It's a place where we encourage and challenge each other to be the best. You want to know more about this? Go to our website, alphaleadership.net, alphaleadership.net. You will see the point there, Great Leadership, GLPA. Click on it. There's a form there. You apply, you want to be part of this. We'll look at it, we'll get back to you. And boom, we are part of the family. All we do is to encourage ourselves. Nobody wants to be overseer over you. Iron sharp net iron, that's all. We sharpen each other. We sharpen each other. There is no hierarchy. There is no senior pastor. There is no supreme leader. There's no evangelist. Every, we just come together to help ourselves to be the best that God has made up to be. I think after this, we are going to have the question and answer, and I'll hand over to Bolanli. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you so much, Pastor Tola, for such an enlightening and empowering session. Good evening, leaders. My name is Bumi Banjo, and I'll be your moderator for this Q&A session. Pastor Tola has just spoken about structure and restructuring in life and ministry. And, and so these principles shared will work if we apply them in different facets of life. Please keep in mind that you can use the chat feature in any of the platforms that you're joining us from to send in your questions tonight. We are going to begin right away the question and answer session for Pastor Tola's session. That was phenomenal, sir. I'm sure that has added a whole lot of value to people's lives. We do have a few questions that I wanna ask you tonight on behalf of all our attendees participating. The first thing you talked about uh, is that without structure, there is chaos. So lack of structure results in chaos. But somebody is asking and they're saying, given the turmoil and the tension also that major restructurings can cause, how much time would it take for a restructure to begin to bear fruit? And how often should a business uh, wait between restructurings? I believe that uh, Dr. Chan said something about that, but one thing that we know of you, Pastor Tola, is that you turn principles into practical nuggets. So maybe you can please share with as many people as like to know tonight, how can you ensure that turmoil and tension, uh, you talked about friction earlier, does not pervade within restructuring? What are the practical steps that we need to take? The, 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 thank you so much, Pastor B. Um, the, the bottom line, honestly, is that people most times take restructuring personal. People most times take restructuring personal. 
The first thing they are thinking about is what they are going to lose. They think about losing visibility. They think about losing, you know, acceptability or some kind of power. Do you understand? So, and at times people feel as if they have been abandoned or they're about to be dumped or abandoned. So it's important for every leader, you know, once you have this understanding and you know the people that will be affected in the restructuring, it's important you have a chat with them. Right now in Jesus House Baltimore, we're in the midst of, of restructuring. Do you understand? You know, and, and before we announced the restructuring, I spoke to our leaders what we are trying to do. Spoke to the workers what we are trying to do. Spoke to the church what we are trying to do. Do you understand? That some people have served the church for over 20 years, some about 25 years. Right now, they're in their early 50s. And we need to start developing new leaders such that they too can serve for the next 25 years without any stress. The people that are over 50 right now, if they serve for another 25 years, they'll be in their 75, 77. And that's, I mean, so you get the point. Now, there are some ministries that they have done well and the ministers and the leaders have done very well. But then we had to restructure and take them out put them in some other places. And some of them, we ask them, where do you want to go? Tell us, and we'll put you there. But I have to speak to them. I have to let them understand that this thing should not be taken personal. We are not saying you have not done a good job. You have done a wonderful job. One of our leaders has served for 22 years in that department, for 22 years. In 22 years, he has developed a lot of leaders, a lot of leaders. Some leaders that are more visible in our church today, he was there before them. But so we said, okay, it's time for you to give room for somebody else so that imagine leaders can come up, can come up, can come up. Listen to me. If you don't restructure on time when you are supposed to, what will happen is that the young Davids will begin to fight you. And some of them will leave you because entrepreneurial people will not wait forever if things are not being restructured to be able to show the face of the current nature of the organization. The other question I think you asked is that for how long are we going to do this? It depends on your organization. It depends on how fast people get it. I can't put a time limit to it, but you have to say to yourself as a leader that we should be able to be done with this in three months or in six months. And I'm telling you, some restructuring can take over a year. They can take over a year. You just do it in stages, just doing stages, just doing stages. Thank you very much, Pastor Toa. That was, that was pretty awesome. So we have another question. Maybe I'll use this question that you just answered as a segue into this next one. So how do you determine then whether a company, an organization, a family needs an entirely new structure or whether it should just tweak the existing one? Is it a total overhaul or can we just tweak some things to make it even better and take it higher to the next level? It depends. It depends on the vision. It depends on the destination where you're going. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because the way somebody that is planning for the Olympics for 10,000 meters is not the same way somebody who's planning for Olympics 100 meters. Right. It's not the same thing they are going to do. So it depends on where you're going. Some people literally out of the door say, we are now looking to build a mega church. So what's the big deal? Let's just be doing what we are doing here. After all, it's where two or three people are gathered. God said, I'm there in their midst. And it's scriptural. God is in their midst. So if that's the vision for them, hey, come on, go ahead and enjoy it. You know. But if the vision that God has shown you is a mega three, 5,000 member church, the way you are going to do your structure is going to be different totally from somebody who is doing a 50 man church or a 30 man church. No, 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 no. You know, there can be many, many of those structures in there, but I'm talking about the strength of the total structure. You understand? You don't build a house that is going to be one story and put in the foundation, a foundation of a 10 story building. It's total waste of money. Even contractors, engineers will tell you it doesn't make any sense. They understand. So it's important. Everybody must know what they have been called to and be able to build their structures according to where they are going. Visualize where you are going, you know, and let that help you 
in. It's not everybody, let me say this, it's not everybody you meet at the airport is going to the same place where you're going. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, so. Thank you very much, sir. So we've been talking about structure and restructuring for organizations and businesses and so on. And, and in your own topic, you, you actually ventured into structure and restructuring in life generally and in ministry. So it's often said that you, you can't give what you don't have. So as we are all leaders here on this platform, listening to you, uh, there's something called self-leadership, you know, in leading yourself, how does structure and restructuring apply in the achievement of your individual goals? Can you shed some light on that, sir? You know, you know the bottom line, you know, we've said this many times, if, if you can't lead yourself, you can't lead anybody. You know, when you look at the letters that Paul wrote to Timothy, in, 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 and he was talking about the appointment of bishops and, and uh, you know, uh, pastors and all that in the church, he, he, he talked about you must be able to have one wife. You must be able to keep their family. You know, how, how do you explain when you cannot keep your family and you want to control how many families that come to church? You know, mm. how, how, how do you talk about marriage when your own marriage is, you yourself, you need a counselor. Do you understand? You know, so you must be able to lead yourself. This is what I say to people. I find it difficult to understand how a leader can call a meeting for three and the leader gets there at four. There's mm. something wrong, fundamentally wrong. The leader walks in as if everybody must be waiting for me. You call the meeting for three. You called it for three. If there is no integrity, there cannot be good leadership. And everybody, and then you now walk in, it's not going to happen. It's wow. not going to happen. No, if I call you for three, I'm here before you. I'm mm. here before you. Every Sunday, and I'm saying this not because it's me. Every Sunday, I come here before a lot of our leaders in this church. I get here. So I know what I, it's, it, you, you will now be coming as the chief executive. After a while, nobody shows up. Because they know you are not going to be there on time. So you must be able to lead yourself. And that's what Paul meant when he said, if he has preached this gospel, he doesn't want to be a castaway. So what does he do? He puts his body under subjection. He puts his body right. under subjection. If you cannot lead yourself, honestly, if you look behind you, you are taking a stroll. Nobody is following you. Nobody. Mm -hmm. you know. And if anybody follows you, Jesus said it, the blind leading the blind, both the blind and the people that is leading, they will fall into the ditch. I pray that's not going to be wow. your question. So you exactly. have to be careful. Who are you following? Wow. 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 Good leadership is subject to integrity. Mm -hmm. It's subject to integrity. Great. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. You said in visualizing your destination, you must come up with how to get there. I think it's on the how that most people get stuck, sir. So there is vision, but there is no strategy. Mm -hmm. So that's when we say we talk the talk, but there is no walk to the talk. So can you, sir, please share practical steps on how you have approached this in your own life? The major thing is that you have to have a teachable spirit. And you must be humble enough to accept that you don't know what you don't know. Wow. So what do you do? You look for people who are already there. This is where mentoring comes in. You know, a lot of people, you know, say, oh, I wanted to be my mentor. I want to be my mentor. And I say, oh, okay. Are you really ready for that? They say, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they call you about two or three times. You don't return their calls. Now you are their enemy. And they are not talking to you again. I say, who, 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 who called you in the first instance? You came now, you know? The Bible said that wisdom is in the heart of a man. He said, but a man of understanding searches it out. Do you understand? So you have to have a teachable spirit by saying to yourself, this is what I want to set up. I love this church, the vision of this church. I love what this church is doing. I would love to pastor a church like this. So what do you do? You go to where that thing is happening, try and sit under the anointing or the teaching or the impartation of that person and learn how they are doing it. Learn how they are doing it. Learn how they are doing it. I went to a church many years ago, maybe about 10 years ago, you know, and, and uh, this is a church that does four services, you know, 
uh, on Sundays, and they do two services uh, for midweek service. And the first thing I said to the pastor, I said, who, who does this? I said, I've never had this before. Two services for midweek. When some people are even praying that people should come for midweek service, you are doing two services. He said, yes. I said, how do you do it? So I went to the church. I was preaching there. As soon as I finished the first service, they took me to a waiting place next to the church. And then I had people singing. So I asked the protocol. I said, what's happening there? He said, they started second service. Ah! I said, what was the transition time? It was no more than 15 minutes. I said, what? How did the people go out? Mind you, in the first service alone, there were about 1,200 people there. Mm. How did they do that? And then, so I asked the pastor, I said, how do you do this? When the pastor came to our church, I asked him the same question, not because I didn't know the answer, because he had already told me the answer. I wanted my ministers and pastors to hear from him. And he said, we rehearse this every Saturday. We mm. plan this. The same way they came in is not the way they are going to go out. They do they, that, that, that. I said, oh my goodness. And that's what is missing today. Many of us have seen church mm. as competition. We have seen okay. setting up our own business as competition. So we are not humble enough to go and learn from those who are doing it and they are doing it well. Mm. It's time for us to drop everything and just sit down under someone. You can go to somebody's church and just say, I'm not here to preach or to minister. I just want to see what you're doing. And I just want to be part of your service. I did this for eight years consecutively by going to Pastor Agus Church in London. For eight years, every year, I didn't go there to preach. I just sit down and I watch. I just sit down and I watch. I just sit down and I watch. Then I came back and I started doing the things that I learned there. Until recently when he came to our church and he said, Tola, don't come again. We need to come to your church and learn what you're doing right now. <laughs> what am I saying? The problem is our people. The problem with church people is that we over-spiritualize. That's why the children of this world are wiser than us. Wow. That's why they are wiser than us. Can you just go and take apprenticeship in a place of where you, what you want to set up so that mm. you learn about the business and you know it before you set it up? And then you are now praying that uh, is the enemy that is attacking you. Which enemy? Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Having a teachable spirit, being humble enough to ask what's going on on your end. Can I learn from you? That's pretty, it, it seems simple. It seems basic, but it takes a whole lot of humility indeed to, to say, I don't know what I don't know. And I want- Ego, to ego is the problem. Ego is the problem. Ego hmm. is the problem. Ego is the problem. You know, people don't want, they don't want to appear as if they don't know. They don't want, they want to appear as if they know. Even when you're asking questions, they're doing like this. They have no clue. They have no clue. Ego. There's nothing wrong in, my mom used to tell me, if you don't know the way, ask. And hmm. when you ask, you not get lost. Why do you want to act as if you know the place? You know, Why? If you really know the place, how come we are circling that place for the third time? Mm, and you say you wow. know where we're going. Ah. You know. Well so, said, sir. A word is enough for the wise. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. So I think this will be the last question that I'm about to take at this time. And um, you talked, you, you touched about, you know, if you don't know something, go and learn. But I think it takes for you to admit that you don't know. So I'm, I'm looking to ask you about a mindset shift. And when we talk about mindset shift now in, in, the, in the area of the followers whom you are leading, in what ways can a leader challenge their followers to look at problems in new ways and to encourage non-traditional thinking? The, the, the leader himself or herself has to be a practical leader. You understand? It has to be somebody that is not rigid. You understand? You know, and um, this thing is very simple, honestly. Um, at least the way I look at it. If you look at yourself in the mirror and you don't like what you see, it's time for you to do something about it. Wow, that's, that's wild. Yes. That's it. If you don't like what you see, you know, you look at the mirror, you look at yourself, maybe you don't like your shape or you don't like the way you're looking or something. You know, I looked at the mirror three or four days ago. I didn't like the way I was looking. I went to the barbers. You know, <laughs> I had a haircut. Nobody wow. told me go and get a haircut. 
Do you understand? Because you see, until you do some things yourself, people are not going to tell you. People are going to see you. They'll say, nobody's going to talk to me in church and say to me, Pastor T, you need a haircut. You know, maybe the only person that would do that might be my children, you know, and there might be my wife. Yes, but, but you have to also have an idea where you are going. Because if you don't know where you are going, honestly, if you are near the place or you get the place to the place, you will not even realize it. You understand? So if you have a vision for your life, you know, this is how to do it. Let us try to pastors, I'm begging you. Let's be more plain and simple to our people. It doesn't take spirituality away. No, it does not. You know, and let people know that, hey, you are here and you have been here for six years. What have you achieved in six years? Is this why you came to America? You know, so why don't you start to do something about it? Let them get home. The Holy Spirit will do the rest. Mm -hmm. And God helping them.